there's a there's a line between burnout and depression. And I've experienced high functioning depression in other seasons of very, very high stress. And just, I, I knew that there was a difference. And the difference between burnout and depression is circumstance. And if you mm. alleviate like all of the stress, like your circumstances completely change, usually your burnout is completely alleviated. Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Our guest today is Emily Ballesteros. Emily earned her master's degree in industrial organizational psychology she currently works as a corporate trainer and a burnout management coach. She's a social media influencer and author of the brand new best-selling book, The Cure for Burnout, How to Find Balance and Reclaim Your Life, which if you're watching, you can see I have right here. I've been reading it myself. Um, Emily, thanks for joining us today. I'm glad that you were able to make time. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah, me too. I, I am. So I, I was mentioning right before we recorded, I feel like I'm burnt out all the time and I'm very prone to it. And I've learned what it was several years ago. Um, so going through your book and reading through like some of its healthy reminders, and then there's so much in there that I think is super beneficial for everyone to know um, mm -hmm. that I'm learning about myself going through your book too. And, and uh, I'm glad that you're able to talk with us about all of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a common experience for people who are feel prone to burnout. It's just kind of, you're either in the cycle or you're escaping from the cycle. And then as soon as things get calm again, there's, uh, whether it's guilt or shame or something that makes us re-add things to our life. Um, if you're used to over-functioning, then you kind of stay over-functioning. That's, uh, it's like your comfort spot. That's a great point. Yeah. I mm -hmm. find myself... That I really I relate to that a lot. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I can imagine when you were a, a young child that your dream was not to necessarily become a burnout coach and a, maybe an author, but uh, yeah. an author. And I don't know, I'm sure you follow this, but your, your book hit number one on Amazon under um, work-life balance. So congratulations. Thank you. If, I, I'm my sure you knew that. My mom sent it to me, actually. Okay. I was trying to, I'm trying <laughs> to decide what my relationship is going to be with reviews and looking at those things just uh, to, you know, preserve the creative inner child in me. Um, but yeah, I have my people on the lookout for the positive things. So my mom, yeah, yeah my mom Good. sent it to me. <laughs> Well, there was one, rev well, now I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm staying away from the review. There was one I read that was like four out of five stars, but it was like a glowing review. I'm like, what is a five then? So you know some what? people just. The reviews are not for the authors. They're for the people. Um, my yeah. husband was telling me that there was one that was like, one star doesn't apply to me because I don't work. And it's like, come on, man. Like, Why you even leave a review? So oh you just gosh. can't even look. You just, it's best to not. That's so, you know, that's funny you say that because I was reading, what was I reading a reviews on? I was reading reviews on Amazon for something yesterday. I can't even remember what it was. Anyway, it was the, um, oh, it was like a, a charger for your phone, like a magnetic charger. People were writing bad reviews because of like shipping taking too long. And I'm like, that's not mm -hmm. what the reviews are for. Like you yeah. shouldn't leave a review for something that was beyond the product's control. Like it's, yeah. Yeah, or if it doesn't we've, apply to you. We've lost the plot when it comes to comment sections and just oh, like wrong. hearing the sounds of our own voice. So, and I say that as someone who like never shuts up on the internet, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I can agree with that. Lord knows I've had my share of comments that <laughs> I shouldn't be reading, but find their way in front of me. It's baptism so, by fire. I honestly think it's better to start with just a, the uh, unexpected wave than to like, I blew up on TikTok in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes it so that going forward, you kind of just like, no, you know, the good comments aren't worth the bad comments. So unfortunately, like, thank you so much to anyone who's ever said something nice. It's Russian roulette with your mental health looking at those comments. So oh. it's not, unfortunately, not worth seeing the nice ones to come across the mean ones that like set you back a month. Well said. <laughs> I can't disagree with any of that at all or, or yeah. provide any more color. It isn't <laughs> worth it. Although I do say like when I get a nice DM um, yeah. and I, I catch it, I don't catch all of them. That's obviously impossible. But when I get a nice one, I usually tell them, I'm like, thank you for taking the time to be nice yeah. on the internet because yeah. so many people don't have that wherewithal to just, you know, 
we got not something nice, don't say it at all. Yeah, Remember, we all learned that, that in kindergarten. I, I don't think not. they teach it. <laughs> If but you don't yeah. have something nice to say, go type it at a stranger on the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. One. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good point. I, the, the kind people like keep being kind because you know, the, it, it, I, I completely understand the desire to retreat and be like, if I'm so happy and content, like I should just retreat and like be like, do that on my own time and not do that super loudly because then ups, people get upset and then mm. it kind of, it like takes something I tried they, it can take something away from you that you wouldn't have lost if you weren't loud about how happy you are and um you have to just like decide if you want to let like the really loud hateful people be the loudest people and the only people creating things um which sucks because it's like you see good people bullied off the internet all the time and it's kind of like good for you like go preserve yourself uh but the other yeah. side of that is like no then we're left with just the angry people or the people who, who have like, I don't give a fuck attitudes, which is so great. And like, I love seeing it because I don't have it. But like, then we are only left with those people. That's a good point. And that's also called Reddit. I don't know if you oh, I are don't Reddit. Go on. I, can't. I don't either. <laughs> Reddit and I Twitter didn't... are the angry places. <laughs> no, no, that's why I, you know, I'm not on Twitter either. I'm like, it's just too, it's too sad. Yeah. It's funny because like I was on the first time I even learned about Reddit was the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. And I went on there and I was out as quick as I went in there with the way people were talking to each other. Like, I just yeah. don't get it. I don't get so yeah. I stay off of it a handful mm -hmm. of times for Usually it's like a Google search that sends me there, but otherwise yeah. it's just, it's the dark place. So yes. you had, you had mentioned casually now. So I like to ask my guests, what do you want to be when you were growing up? How'd that change and lead you to where you are? You mentioned mm -hmm. you had some um, childhood creativity, which is why you don't read the reviews. So I'm curious to get that question from you. What did you want to be when you were a young child and how did that evolve? Um, I, I wanted to be so many things as a kid. Um, and I was very lucky, like that no matter what I approached my parents with, they were like, okay. And like, I don't know if there are lax attitude about it, as opposed to being like, no, you need to get a career that's going to pay. And that's going to be like in STEM, or that's going to be respected or blah, blah, blah. Like they were like, all right, you want to be a babysitter? let's start getting you some babysitting gigs. You want to be an actor? Like, let's get you in some acting classes or like, let's put you in little theater things. So they kind of just let me explore anything I was interested in, which I uh, was invaluable. Like that still today, it makes a huge difference in my willingness to try things and be bad at them or be new at them. Um, even if that's just like a spin class down the street, I'm like, I can show up and suck and it's fine. There's like no actual <laughs> repercussion as opposed to, you know, like the hammer coming down anytime you weren't good at anything or didn't choose the right thing. Um, and so, I finally got around to college and I liked the idea of being a nurse. Um, I liked the freedom that came with the schedule, literally all the wrong reasons to be a nurse. I liked that you could work three days a week. I know it was like such a hard three days a week, but um, I liked the idea of it. And then I got to my sophomore year and I was taking the science classes and I was passing them, but I really didn't enjoy it. Um, I started to realize I thought the human body was kind of gross. I actually get like full body <laughs> chills anytime I see somebody like bleeding or talking about pain. I don't know what I was thinking going into this field. Um, and so I was like, okay, I want I, I want to help people and I still was interested in that degree of freedom and so then transitioned to um psychology and business so that I could go get my master's degree in industrial organizational psychology which is like um an MBA with a people emphasis instead of a business emphasis so a lot of times they go into like HR or consulting or um business That's ownership. interesting because my view of it when I first read that degree was the opposite. I thought it really? would be more like the corporate side of like how to apply yeah. it in industry. Yeah. Some some parts of it are. Like I have friends okay. who came out of my program who um work with uh like construction workers and make sure that they have best practices so people aren't getting hurt. And um it, it can really go any direction that has to do with employee experience. And mm. um I was more interested in that than business business side of it. Um, and so then I kind of got into training and development. And the more I learned about that world, uh, that was what I focused on. Um, and so I did that internally for a couple of companies and then burned myself out um, and then decided to uh, focus that kind of background on burnout specifically. And then from there started building out the burnout management business. Oh, very nice. What kind of training did you do? Was it like HR training side or? Um, most companies have, uh, sometimes it's a part of HR, um, or like I, you could be a part of the HR team and you kind of do any training that they might need internally, um, for another company. It was, um, 
more of a change management type role. And so mm-hmm. any changes that came and necessitated training, or if there was a team that needed some kind of specific training, you developed it and then you would deliver it. And so it was really just internally, internal needs based, which is great and teaches you so much, but you're not really, it doesn't always feel like you're an expert on the thing you're creating a training on. You're just kind of like totally. creating it. Yeah, that's always the issue I feel like with those kinds of roles. So I have sales training background. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in software marketing and sales enablement for most of my career, and yeah. even train and training salespeople is like its own thing because they yeah. don't really care and they just want to, you know, sell something and they don't really want to learn what they're selling. But um, the some of that HR and process stuff, it it just feels like you're kind of training people to use something that you don't even know how to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like a talk track. And sales is a whole industry. And it's, I mean, I, f- I feel like you could get and somebody with any degree of experiences coming from sales, a lot of burnout, especially if it's a toxic environment, which a lot of places have. Yeah. What, what was your burnout like experience before you started? Cause you said you, you started feeling burnt out. Did you know what it was at the time? Obviously you knew what it was at the time, but did you um, like get those warning signs within yourself that you're now sharing with other people to start recognizing? Yeah. Well, that's a good question actually. Cause I did not, well, at the time it was like 2017, 18, like, you know, burnout wasn't the buzzword that it is today. Um, mm, so I was burning out things. from, yeah. Pre, pre, like it was, you know, the landscape hadn't even changed yet. I got more insane after that. Um, but I was working full time. I was getting my master's degree full time in person night classes. Um, and then I was commuting two to three hours a day. So I would wake up, I would like speed walk a mile through downtown Chicago to the train. And then I would, uh, wait, are you in Chicago? I was in Chicago. I lived there for three years. I'm in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm in Wicker Park. Okay, very nice. Yeah. I lived in Where Loop, Loop oh, cool. for two years and then um, Arlington Heights for a year. Oh, I'm from Rolling Meadows. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> so funny. small yeah. world. Um, yeah, it is. I lo- it was nice out there. I didn't. I couldn't commit to it for a lifetime, but it was nice. I'm in Seattle now. <laughs> oh, cool. How do you like Seattle? Yeah. It's really nice. Um, before Seattle, so I lived in Chicago. I'm from Northern California, lived in Chicago, moved to Colorado, and then moved to Seattle. And they all kind of have the same vibe, like Colorado, Seattle, Chicago. It's not terribly different. Um, but I, I like them. They all have good food, yeah. and they're all kind of up to date with the world. So that's nice. That's true. That's true. I haven't been to Seattle. That's why I asked that. I, I, I agree oh, about Colorado. I know. I know. I know. I have friends out there, too. I just never... Yeah gotten out there but anyway mm-hmm. i'm sorry i interrupted you to, no, to have that little <laughs> nugget but you were yeah. you were talking about your your experience feeling burnout in your corporate job yes so um i would commute uh, it was more than an hour long train ride out to where i was working and then um i was working a full day oh no, sorry i would get off the train take go to a bus stop, take the bus to work, work a full day, go back to the bus stop, bus back to the train, train back to the city, walk a mile through the city to my night classes. That was from like 6 to 8.30 PM. And then I would walk another mile home. So incredible cardiovascular shape at the time. But I was so tired. I was just always busy. And when I got home, I had homework or I had something else I needed to catch up on. It was just I was experiencing one of the three types of burnout, which was burnout by volume. Um, the sheer volume of things I was just trying to include was uncomfortable. So right. uh, there are other types of burnout. And some people are burning out because it's just their, their job itself that they're at is super toxic. Their workload is super unreasonable. I worked with great people. I had a reasonable workload, but it was just a matter of yeah. volume for me. Um, and so I got to the point where I was, you know, very open to getting sick. Uh, I got chronic migraines. I was like, Oh, a migraine. That means I can't work for the next couple hours. Cause I'm in so much pain. And that was a relief. And that was like a huge red flag to start to look into. I want to, <laughs> yeah, I want to pause on that because I read, I, I'm getting confused now where I read. Cause I listened to a podcast you were on too. One of these places, you had talked about that, like wishing you were sick. And I do that where I'm like, I'm going to like manifest getting sick so I can just take a half of day today. Yeah. Or, and you know, I'll jokingly say it, but like, I'm really not joking. Like mm-hmm. I would love to be wiped out for a few days. Yeah. <laughs> it would just be, it would be amazing. So that's a, you know, that's a, a really strong sign. And I think a lot of people probably have that and don't connect the dots there. So mm-hmm. how did you how did you start to connect the dots? 
Um, well, I mean, at that point I was like, I don't think, cause there's a, there's a line between burnout and depression and I've experienced high functioning depression and other seasons of very, very high stress. And just, I, I knew that there was a difference and the difference between burnout and depression is circumstance. And if you mm. alleviate like all of the stress, like your circumstances completely changed, usually, usually your burnout is completely alleviated. Whereas you could change all your circumstances if you're depressed. And that doesn't mean that the chemicals are going to change in your brain and you're not going to necessarily still experience that depression. So I was like, this isn't quite that, but what could it be that is, that is pretty similar, but I'm also, you know, crying on the train, crying in conference rooms, mm -hmm. dreaming about work, like wishing that I could, you know, get out of work by being sick or getting in an accident or something like, what is this? And the closest thing I found was burnout. Um, and then from there, I feel like I just kind of, well, I did a ton of market research, talked to a lot of other burned out people to get this kind of modern sense of burnout and what it looks like and feels like and sounds like when people are burned out nowadays. And that's a framework that you have in your book. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So, no, no, I was just going to say, do you want to like, tell, tell me about what your research was like? I, I find this very fascinating because I, so I worked for a Swedish company in 2018 and 2019, mm -hmm. which was, and you know, it's funny because before that I was doing the commute out to Buffalo Grove, which mm -hmm. was walk a mile to the train, take yeah. the train out to Highland Park. I don't know if you know all these suburbs, but yeah. Highland Park, get on a shuttle to go to Buffalo Grove, come back to it. It was an hour and a half to two hours each way, each day, eight yeah. hour day, coming home, rinse and repeat, do the same thing. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so that was very, very relatable. But um, yeah, well, yeah what, what I think is so interesting is I started bringing up these feelings in 2018 in 2019 and my coworker at the time I was at a Swedish company. So it was mm -hmm. like six of us in the States and like 200 in Sweden. And they have like clinical diagnoses for burnout, which yeah. I was like, wait, what? They're like, yeah, there's literally like parts of your brain that stop functioning at the same levels or those lights mm -hmm. dim a little bit. And there's, there's like, they go on leave for it. People go yeah. on leave for burnout there. Mm -hmm. And so I was that I was lucky enough to have that validation that what I was feeling was, was not, but it really wasn't mm -hmm. until COVID. So you even finding other people that had burnout, you know, in 2017, 2016, 2018, whenever that was, that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty daunting task to try and. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I got lucky in that I, I didn't have a large social following at the time, but I had a large enough social following to ask anybody, Hey, do you ever feel these, you know, signs mm -hmm. and symptoms and not necessarily calling it burnout because again, it was not a buzzword. Um, yeah. And then people who are like, yes, I always feel like I'm, I have always have something to do, but I'm not making enough progress. Or I am waking up in fight or flight, like dream, you know, thinking about work before I go to sleep, thinking about work the second I wake up, like checking emails before my head even lifts off the pillow type of thing. Don't do any personal care. Don't like, it was a lot of the same because and so the methodology that um, was developed after talking to tons and tons of burned out individuals, these are the five areas that I call the um, pillars of burnout management that everybody consistently like ends up needing to strengthen these skills um, or struggles with one of these skills. And that can lead them further from or towards burnout. And that's mindset, time management, stress management, boundaries, and personal care. And usually somebody can hear those five areas and be like, oh, it's boundaries. Like for me, like the reason that I'm struggling so much is boundaries. Um, and I don't set them or I'm uncomfortable setting them or I'm a people pleaser. So I don't set them or I'm a high achiever. So I don't set them. And, um, you just kind of start by looking at that framework. And that was what I kind of built around when it came to solutions. That's so, that's so good. You know, I feel like my personal experience and what I've seen other people that I've worked with, like being a leader and stuff like that, the whole work, like we have, our culture is, especially here in the States, having worked for a Swedish company where they, they take their time. Like you're very rarely going to hear from most of them once that, once they're done working, when they go on vacation, which they take month long vacations every July, they're gone. Yeah. Like it's like cell phones don't work. <laughs> They're yeah. gone, gone. And I, I learned to sort of um, admire that and try to like incorporate that into the team, that mentality into the team that I had here in the US along with the people that I had over in Sweden. Because you could just see like the productivity was there, the happiness or contentment was there. 
things weren't as contentious among teams. And like, I've worked at toxic places, right? Yeah. Very toxic mm -hmm. places. And even the way that people engage and interact with one another, it's like, it's just not kind. It's, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not productive. And I think, you know, there's something to be said about people a person's sensitivity and stuff. And I'm a sensitive person. So, you know, I can understand, but mm -hmm. I feel like we are in this culture, especially since COVID where it is just like all day, every day you can be working. I find myself doing it. I'm actually pretty decent at boundaries and it's I learned though. Not, not, I used to be terrible at them. I'm good at them. Yeah. I found happiness. Like you find yeah. peace when you, when you start implementing them. Yeah. But, um, I feel like we just go, 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 go. And I find myself, I'm like, oh, it's eight o'clock, right? I've worked my eight, nine hours for the day. It's eight o'clock. Instead of just sitting down and watching a TV show, which may or may not be something we're going to talk about, <laughs> but um, the uh, that drive inside me or whatever it is, is like, well, you could just go like answer a couple emails. That's less to do tomorrow. And it, I see the cycle mm -hmm. and I see myself fall into it. Yeah. So. Where do you even start if you're, you know, you want to assess people or you want someone to self-assess to find out what, if they're experiencing burnout, what type of burnout are they experiencing? Like, where can they start? Mm -hmm. Obviously by the book, but, mm -hmm. but, but like, how can you start doing uh, a self-assessment to see what's going on? Yeah. I mean, even just hearing like, you know, you can describe the cycle that you've seen yourself in um, for years previous. Most people, as soon as they kind of describe their lifestyle or they reflect on their lifestyle, they know if they tend to overfunction and if they feel guilt when they rest and if they prioritize work over some other areas of their life. Um, and like you said, like you stopped doing that as much when you started, when you like loved your life and you had other things. Like I love reading. I'm always reading. Mm -hmm. And that is like actually competes with my work now. And I think everybody needs things that compete with their work. If, if there's no competition for your work, then obviously you're just going to work by default because it feels like at least there's a purpose behind that. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for a place to start, well, first of all, the two types of people who burn themselves out most often are high achievers and people pleasers. Um, and also people who struggle with a victim mentality because well I'll go through each of them high achievers prioritize achievement over most things and as a result they can uh, kind of compromise on their quality of life in the name of achievement they also a lot of times feel in debt to their potential and so um, I talk about that when I talk to people who have who are entrepreneurs especially or who have a platform or who are influencers or things along those lines because there's such a sense of debt to the platform or debt to your business or you could always over function you could always do more and um then as a result you can burn out <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's a high achieving piece and then for people pleasers Guilty. they <laughs> it's so <laughs> easy to do and there's such it's there's seemingly a reward for it um and then for people pleasers, they would rather be uncomfortable than make other people uncomfortable. And so they overcommit a lot of times or they get themselves into situations that they know are not in their best interest, but that they they feel like they're kind of obligated to, even though they're the ones telling themselves they should do it. Or maybe other people are telling them they should do it, which is just even worse. That's like a people pleaser's nightmare. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And people are people are everywhere wanting stuff from you. And it's like the bigger you get, the more people want and the less you have to give and the stronger your boundaries have to be, or you'll get eaten alive. Like you're, you'll drown in the sea of opportunities. Um, and then the last one's victim mentality. And that is, um, just kind of feeling like, you know, I've tried solutions before and they didn't work and my life just sucks. And this is just what it is. So I'm going to stop trying. And I've seen, I've seen so many people who are in How really people bad function jobs. like that though. I know, you know what, for some people it's, at least it's something like they'd rather feel something than nothing. And they, it, it's kind of just become part of their, part of their it's personality. Like a, abusive relationship with yourself. Yeah. It's... Yeah. And sometimes it starts with like a parent who is really, um, kind of a, who feels like they're a victim and they learn the like they just learn the language for it and then they go through school and they're like they kind of start to develop that chip on their shoulder that that can remain um and that's not always the case that's just like some of the cases that I've seen but yeah feeling yeah. like a victim and then not make taking action from that point and then you just really feel stuck right right i think um one of the things i wanted to ask you about with the victim thing is the victim, is that like a, like they think that even though they may be taking something on themselves, 
and kind of setting themselves up in this situation, they're seeing it as outside forces that are impacting their life. Is that kind of that, that the context? In, in, in some cases, yeah. Like okay. they, it's that um, internal versus external locus of control. So if mm-hmm. you believe there's an internal locus of control, you control your life and the things in it and you make all the choices and call the shots. And if you have an external locus of control, you think, something else is calling the shots. Like I am just a participant and like everything is happening to me. And so why like, and and then they feel like, okay, all this is like out of my hands anyways. And I'm just dealt a shit hand and like my life just sucks. And then they stop the, and then they don't feel that internal empowerment to like, no, I, this is my life and nobody's going to come in and fix it for me. And if I want it to be good, Mm -hmm. I have to make it good. Even if that means I have to do a lot of hard things to do it. Yeah. That's super relatable too. Cause I, I sometimes I still feel this way, but I'm aware of it. So I think that's mm-hmm. better. But I often feel like the world is happening to me and I'm not an active participant in my life. Mm-hmm. And it's gotten better and I've taken, you know, some control. But there was a while there where I was like, I am just going through these days. And that was actually when I re- I renamed my podcast to Eyes Wide Open when I was like going mm-hmm. through this process of like, I can't just go through life, like just yeah. sleepwalking through it. I've got to like pay attention, know what's going on with me and what's going yeah. on in the world. And, you know, that's one of the main reasons that I, I renamed the show and changed it up a little bit. But I feel like that mentality, there's so much more going on there that you have to um, kind of go inside to figure out like, what can I control? And what mm-hmm. you can control is how you react to the things that are happening to you. Yeah. And so it's not easy. And it's easy for me to say, I'm just admitting I don't even do it myself, but um, all the time, but it's a challenge for people. And I I think it's, you know, with burnout, it's kind of a name it to tame it too. Like I know when Mm -hmm. I learned what it was, I was like, Oh my God, this is like life changing just to know that this is a thing and I'm not Mm -hmm. crazy or this, you know, level of depression or whatever it is. And Mm -hmm. I, I feel like people need that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the more people talk about it too, because some people feel like it's shameful to talk about, especially if you work at, you know, a a big company where everybody is burned out and has disregarded it for so many years. Then if you're like, wait, I think I'm burned out. They're like, that's cute. You've only been here for three years. Wait till you've been here for 20 (laughs) years. Like, and they could actually not care less. So I get that at some places, you know, it's just not as acknowledged, but it, it is, it is like helpful to name and to talk about and to almost frame, like, it's probably going to happen to everyone in their lifetime. So it's better you have information about it than that you don't. Right. I totally agree. What is your take? Um, so you've worked with corporations, you've worked with individuals too. Like what's your take on burnout culture? Like I, I've read, a, I've read some of that as you've stated, um, you know, it's like a hustle. It's like a productivity thing. I know I feel these things, but what's your assessment from your research and from your, your work and your experiences of what the heck is going on in our corporate culture? That's, that's driving people to uh burnout. Yeah. So, um, there, in some cases, it's on the business's side, and the business is just they expect more than somebody can do comfortably, and um, sometimes they take an interest in that and they're willing to work around that. And other times, the bottom line is more important. And even if you have to overfunction to do it, even if you don't necessarily have all the resources to do it, you weren't trained properly to do it, you don't have the proper leadership to do it, they still expect the final result. And the employee experience is just so objectively unpleasant that. Of course, you're going to experience burnout eventually. Um, Some companies are really great and they kind of, um, I tried to make a TikTok about this a while ago, like put like the bumper, like guardrails up, like if you were bowling and the gutters are the uh, completely burning out, like they, companies will take the step to try to manage the employee experience and, you know, really enforce, like, do not work more than these hours. Um, Here Mm -hmm. are resources if you need them. Train their, they train their leadership and managers so that they are really strong leaders and also, so that they can spot burnout, so that they can coach people through it, and so that they model work life balance and yes. actually like demonstrate it. Because you can't have, you can't be a manager that's a workaholic and say, uh, you can leave at five. I'm going to stay till seven and I'm going to email you until, you know, I go to sleep at night. And you don't have to email back. Like they, you know, they usually schedule send nice, is, a, but... <laughs> is a tool at your disposal too. Yeah. For all the leaders out there, um, There's an occasional time I I will accidentally forget to schedule send, but if it's after hours, I try to consciously schedule send for the next day, just because I know when I get those messages, 
they stress me out. Yeah. And so I know I'm doing that to someone who's more junior, sometimes often younger, mm-hmm. more impressionable, probably a little more anxious about, you know, I'm 38. I've been laid off three times in my career already. And it's yeah. like, you know, it kind of creates this, this anxiety of, of mm-hmm. job security that I think younger people are, are living with on top of, you know, the pressures of having uh, um, these high quality and important jobs. But yeah. I talk frequently on uh, my LinkedIn, actually. It's where, where I write a lot about uh, burnout and mental health in the workplace and how to be a, a good supportive um, leader and how empathy is the, the number one leadership skill that you need to develop and all of these things. And I think that what I've noticed, and I've worked at big companies, I've worked at startups, I've consulted across the board um, and, and you know medium-sized companies too. What I've noticed is it, a lot of companies say it, they don't live it. Mm-hmm. And that's not just with burnout or, or that's like with the mental health support and making sure that people are um, well, right? And there's definitely a line where an employer doesn't you know, need to cross, but I feel like a lot of it's rhetoric mm-hmm. and a lot of it is um, great when things are good, but when things are bad and someone needs it the most or people need it the most, or there's layoffs or whatever that is, it's like the first thing to go out the window. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody is supposed to be replaceable in in a company. Like that just means that you've designed your organization well enough that, and every role is documented well enough that somebody could be plucked out and somebody else could be popped in, like assuming you're, you're kind of like cogs in a machine and it should kind of feel that cut and dry. And I, I, and other ways, like there are really high functioning teams where it doesn't feel that mechanical and you, everybody brings themselves to work. It's not just like they bring Mm -hmm. like the employee piece of themselves to work. Like they get to be really creative. There's a lot of psychological safety. So you can bring ideas and you can be yourself and there's camaraderie and some companies can do that. But companies that are really big, that there's not psychological safety, you can't try to adopt that smaller companies um culture into theirs then it just becomes toxic because it's like what do you mean Mm. you don't care as if we're a family when it's like you're a giant corporation of course they don't feel that level of safety with you that they would if they were on this seven person team it's just uh it's everybody like aspires to a certain company culture but they they don't always actually walk can't deliver it yeah. yeah. Well, and I I love that you said that. I think it's also important that um, these companies or leaders or teams or whatever that do create kind of these these like psychologically safe things. A lot of that is the soft skills yeah. that create that outside of what you're saying in rhetoric or what you're saying on a training or what you're saying, you know, with this new support software solution, better help or whatever that we, we, we've got, um, here it's what I find is when I have like personal relationships on some level with people and I never, listen, I never say family. It's like, it's not like, maybe we can be friends. You're definitely an acquaintance. You're 100% (laughs) a coworker, like, but but that I think is that is toxic in its own way. But I feel like when we have those personal relationships with people, that's when you can like really sense like a change in behavior or a change in productivity and and address those things. And one of the things that I've started doing with my teams is we do a 16 personalities test. Hmm. And then we all take like five minutes to talk about things that we we liked about or things that surprised us about it. And um use that as like a talking point to figure out like how we like to work together. And I learned so much about my teams that way. And, you know, I do learn like some people don't mind the six, seven, eight o'clock at night email, and they would much rather have, you know, some other piece that would help them feel more secure. So it can be done. People is my point. I don't need to get on a a soapbox (laughs) here, but we can do better as leaders. We can support people. You can give people space to to have a lazy day and a less productive day. And I think we can do that as mm-hmm. a whole. The other thing I wanted to ask you about relating to that, and did you have something to say? I'm sorry. I was going to say, what's your personality type of the 16 personalities? Oh, mine, I'm an INFJ. I have oh. been, yeah, from, I think the first time I took it was my early 20s. I took like the Myers-Briggs, the old mm-hmm. school one. And the 16 personalities one was um, probably like five years ago. I did, maybe longer than that I did for mm-hmm. the first time. What's yours? I'm an INFJ. 
Mm. Yeah. I'm not really surprised by that. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know you that well. But. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No, yeah. the more, you know, the more it's like, yeah, that makes sense. And then all for that, I don't know if you've taken the Enneagram one as well. <laughs> I had a guest on my show that introduced me to that. Yeah. I'm a five. Okay. I'm a three, yeah. which is like okay. the achiever type. And so yeah. I just, you know, it's perfect for the burnout business and whatnot. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't, I, I was going to say this earlier, but then I got distracted. Um, I actually forced myself to be like a high achiever. And I actually don't think I've shared this on this podcast before, but like for me, I was so dead set on like outgrowing my, my, you know, middle, lower class socioeconomic upbringing that I just put so much pressure on myself. And I had this goal. And this goal was, I'm going to walk downtown Chicago in a suit and go to an office and I'm going to make money. Yeah. And I had this vision of myself. And I remember the first time I did, I'm going to live downtown. I'm going to get in that hustle and bustle. I'm going to bust my ass and I'm going to make something of myself. And I'm going to be a CMO, a chief <laughs> marketing officer. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make all this money. I'm never going to have to worry about, you know, where meals are coming or getting evicted or all of that stuff. So I would worked hard, was the first person in my family to go graduate college, like all of this stuff, get the corporate job working. And then a few years ago, I was um, a VP in software and I became an interim CMO. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> I sat there with this and they were encouraging me to like go for the full role. And I was like doing it for a few months. I'm like, I don't know if I want this. Yeah. And I thought to myself, and it was a real like eye opening moment for me when I was like, I've been working so hard. I've sacrificed a lot, um, you know, relationships, friendships, doing things that people in their 20s do, all of that stuff, because I just wanted to work, work, work and get out of it. And then I realized like, I never, you never actually get out of it. Mm -hmm. Like you're always, you're never going to get to that point where you're, you know, you're, you're not grinding. It's just not part of the culture that we yeah. have in this country. Definitely. And and that was where I was like, I don't know if this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And, I and you have to do it. <laughs> I feel like that's like, you have to do so many things to realize that it may not be what you want. And then we have this like sunk cost bias of like, well, I've already put in so much effort to it. So I should stick with it. Whether that's like, you already went through nursing school, you already went through law school, like you, you know, always thought you wanted to live in New York and you get there and you're like, oh, I fucking hate this place. So like, there's so many <laughs> different areas where you could think that, and that's why it's so beneficial to have a really tight uh, kind of of loop between like idea and action because so you figure out so much quicker what mm. is and sometimes you can't sometimes you know it takes years to get to that place where you get what you thought you wanted and then you realize like this is not actually I did it once and I'm glad I did it because I always would have wondered what if but now um you know self-awareness isn't a punishment and I'm gonna choose to do something different ah, very 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 well <laughs> said I also wanted to, <laughs> since I mentioned it I wanted to uh talk about the part in your book which I should have marked that in market where you talked about um, your comfort TV shows, basically. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, mine is friends. Mm -hmm. And when I was, when I get burnt out and I'm really, all I want to do is just binge watch friends. Mm -hmm. And that was, I never associated that with the burnout before. I kind of thought it was like a depression thing. Cause I do suffer from high functioning depression as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, reading that I was just like oh that's why I've watched so much friends over the years also why I captain a trivia team that dominates every time we go play yeah but... there you go <laughs> that's so fun is that really yeah so yeah do like you that. exactly share you know share your thoughts on what some of those things that you could be doing and not even realizing like watching yeah. you know binge watching your favorite show over and over and over again yeah. So, um, so they're like the clinical signs of burnout, you know, like thinking about work constantly, anxiety about work, disturbed sleep, um, having a low mood. Um, what are the, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, mental fatigue, physical fatigue, emotional fatigue. Um, and those are kind of the more clinical signs, but there are also personal red flags of burnout, which is one of those things like rewatching a comfort TV show. It's something that you notice you do, um, that's not necessarily going to be on the World Health Organization's website. And so that might be rewatching a show, uh, gravitating towards a comfort food more often, minus top ramen, um, 
and calling it like yeah i mean on the third day now that's you're when i my know pizza consumption yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. once a week i have to have pizza <laughs> yeah you, I, you can i'll let you make that judgment call for yourself you just pay attention <laughs> to when you're having the pizza i guess um <laughs> But uh, sometimes people online shop more or they order food more often or they um, pick up any bad habits that they might have, like they will let laundry or dishes pile up that they normally wouldn't or not get back to texts and calls and FaceTimes like they normally would. And it's really just whatever you do when you are really low on resources and you're kind of just coping, like you're just trying to comfort yourself. And there's this like crisis of coping, just like. I feel like that's what little treat culture is, is everybody's like, mm. well, I can't have security. So I'm going to bypass security, jump straight to happiness, but I can, I can only, I can buy happiness in like this form of this little treat. Like I can buy comfort in the form of this little treat. Um, and that's just like a substitution for true comfort. And that's why, like, I think people are saying that the millennial midlife crisis is wanting a soft life, like wanting to run away from their busy life and go live in the middle of nowhere and like not have, like only have a landline and work somewhere like at a coffee shop or a bookstore where they can just go to work, work, and then like leave and go home. And instead of that, we have this like consumerism and constant busyness. And we're always behind whether it's mm -hmm. via text, email, all that. Opposite. It's like a badge of honor to be busy. And yeah. I, I, I hate that. Mm -hmm. I hate that. But I, I, it's just something you see so many people like, where is a badge of honor? Like, oh, I'm yeah. so busy. I don't have time to do this. Well, that is self care. Mm -hmm. Or that's like, um, uh, what did you call it? Uh, pocket predictable pockets of rest. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, that's those things that you have to make time for mm -hmm. so that you're you know, you're actually able to recharge. Cause that's the other thing too, is like, I think we all recharge a little bit differently. Yeah. And I know for me, it's like, it's walks, it's quiet. NFJ, mm -hmm. you like to read to relax. Yeah. I like walks and podcasts or books on tape and um, just kind of get into thinking about something bigger than my everyday life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But people don't know that they don't know what that recharges for them. Yeah. And you kind of develop it starting young. And so if you grew up in a house too, that didn't necessarily encourage rest or like, I know a lot of people like, you know, they had to, to do all their homework, take care of all their responsibilities before they got to go play or before they got to do whatever their hobby was. And not to say that that's not a valuable lesson to learn uh, at some point, but mm -hmm. then it creates an adult who has a really hard time relaxing if there's anything left on their to-do list. And you know, life's not supposed to feel like this giant running to-do list. Like the things that we include in it are supposed to feel very natural and um, feel like it all contributes to living a pretty calm, predictable life. And yet it feels like everybody's sprinting to each responsibility and nothing feels like enough. And nobody's like, if you do meet somebody that's really calm, it's like, well, how did you manage that? Because it's so unorthodox to see nowadays. It's funny you say that. That used to be me. I used to, I, I found calm for a good, like two years. It was really mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm, yeah. now I'm back to not being calm again, but, uh, <laughs> Cycle, but no, that's a, cyclical. right. That's a good point. So you said, you said reading. Um, yeah. So you reading, what, what are some of the other ways that you, uh, aside from reading, what are some of the other ways that you recharge and kind of protect your peace or boundaries that you've set or any of that kind of stuff that you can share, uh, to kind of round out your story a little bit? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, reading is like my, my big main hobby and I read, I don't know, at, at least two or three hours a day, which I know is more wow. than the average person, but it's, and, and, you know, from the outside, it sounds like, wow, I'm reading like fantasy romance books most of the time. So I was going to ask you, what kind of books are you reading? <laughs> is it making me smarter? No, but I find so much joy in it. It's so good for my attention span. I could, when it's like, oh, you have to go and wait for this thing. I'm like, well, if I could bring my Kindle, I don't really care. Like it makes so mm. many things where I would go and be waiting easier. Um, so yeah, I, I like anything you've seen on, well, no, anybody who's on book talk. If you've seen the books, I feel like I started there years ago and then kind of just like spiraled from there. So lots of fantasy romance, dark romance, things of that nature. But, um, besides Rome, besides that, I go on a lot of walks too. And, um, that's when I do any social calls that I need to do. I am not a phone talker. I, when I see incoming calls, I'm like, oh, 
come me on. Too. Like, it's 2024. What are we doing? Like, just text. You got to text <laughs> me that you want to talk. And yeah. then I'll make a decision if that's mm-hmm. an acceptable thing yeah. to do. Yeah, because like a lot of times I'm just not mentally prepared to talk or like I talked all day. So I'm just like not going to yeah. talk in the night too. But I go on walks and I am lucky to live in a walkable area. So um, I walk to the store, even if I just get myself like a little fizzy water. I walk to this thrift store that we have Chill. and I just like looking at stuff and um, seeing if they got any good books in. And I feel like it's so much more fun to like hunt and find something, um, the feminine urge to gather. But like I go and I just like, want to it, it's more fun looking that way than it would be going online and like shopping specifically for what i want so i don't know i think that's what turned into a hobby of mine that's so interesting because that's the same with me and during covid yeah. when everyone else and I, I actually associated this with like well it was something to do during mm-hmm. covid like i'll go to the grocery store i'll go to the target whatever that is but that is something that like i still do and so i'll order stuff right i'll order groceries sometimes i don't have time whatever but i actually like going to the store and yeah. not necessarily having a purpose all the time. And again, mm-hmm. there's a consumerism part of that, but it is relaxing. So maybe it's an INFJ thing. We don't want to talk yeah. on the phone and mm-hmm. we want to go wander around. I have to ask yeah. you, when you were in Chicago, had you, do you ever make it out to myopic books in no, Wicker? No, I did not. <sighs> well, next time you come here, make sure you check. It is a used yeah. bookstore. It is okay. so old. I forgot how long it's been there. It's been there a long time and it's open like 12 to five or something Monday through Sunday. And so mm-hmm. it is, it's got like layers and rooms upon layers and rooms. It's like, it's out of a movie. Cool. It's so I'll write cool. that down right now. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. You should just, just Google it too. But next time you're in Chicago, you got to go check that out. Yeah. Love it's, a bookstore. Fun... Yeah. And it, it's just like got that like old library smell to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not mm-hmm. making any sense Love anymore, it. but yes. I think you would like, I'll go, I think I bought a book there once. I'll go browse the books in there for like two hours. It just yeah. doesn't even matter. Yeah. yeah. You have to like it though. Cause that's like somebody else's like torture when they <laughs> to go and look at books. It's like, why would you spend your time that way? But it really is like so many people have such different things that relax them. So just got to lean into yeah. what it is and drop the perspective or perspective, the um, perception angle. Like, because I used to post everything, like I have a social media following and I felt like that sense of debt to the platform and like, I need to give them everything. And then I realized how anything you post on the internet is basically people think you're open to feedback and will give their opinion on. (laughs) And it was like, Oh my gosh, wait, no, I was just sharing. I actually don't care what people think about this. Um, and so it's kind of like the same with like the good, the bad's not always worth the good. So like, if I'm enjoying this like romance book that just objectively sounds, it it sounds terrible. Like when you just read the descriptions of some of them, uh, if I post that I'm reading it, then I'm like opening myself up for feedback and I don't really care what somebody thinks about it. I'm going to do it anyways. So then it makes you want to stop sharing. And so just like I do, I read and I, it's almost like, you know, how when people start working out and they post constantly every single time they work out because it's kind of just like, they're still building the habit. And there's also that yeah. like social per- per- uh, perception, like kind of thing. And, and then once you do it long enough, you just stop posting about when you do it. Cause it's just part of who you are and you just like do it anyways. And it doesn't even like always make sense to post about it. That's how I felt with that transition for reading where it's like, I'm still doing it in the background, but I don't need to show people that I'm doing it. I've already built the habit, like all of that. No, I, I love that. And one of the most freeing things for me was, and you know, you, you kind of talked about it a little earlier. It's like, you know, my platform, air quotes to those listening, it was like, boom, one day I woke up and I had it. And I didn't really post much on social media. I'm kind of a private person. Um, I used to say that all the time too, while I was, um, you know, in my reality TV era, I would always say, I'm like, well, I don't really want to talk about that. I'm a private person. It's like, well, you're not a private person anymore. So it's time to start talking about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I had this pressure to post this, do this three times a week. This sound goes viral. This does. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I don't need, I wasn't even posting a month ago on social media, Mm -hmm. except like random pictures where I thought my dog looked cute. Yeah. And I went through this for probably a year after um, this started. And then I kind of got to the point where I'm like, one, I'm shutting off notifications because that dopamine hit, whether you know it's happening, you want to happen of like, you know, thousands of likes and comments and endless amount, it will just keep you on that phone nonstop. And you're not even on your own timeline anymore. So like shutting off notifications on social media was 
huge for me to mm-hmm. like start this journey of being like, I'm actually not going to post three times a week unless I want to post three times a week. Unless yeah. I have something to say, mm-hmm. or I have, you know, a new podcast episode, or I have a uh, commentary on something going on or some news to share. Like it, you don't have to, I'm not required to even be on social media, you know, mm-hmm. but you kind of build again, it's that like productivity thing. It's that, yeah. that hustle mindset. And my advice to anyone out there is do social media on your own time and it will change your life. And if you don't want to post, I'll go weeks without posting anything. Yeah. Well, usually I'll post the podcast clips, but I'll go like weeks without sharing anything of my life because A, I don't have anything I want to share or B, I'm not in the headspace to like have the stress of social media. And mm-hmm. I think that people, um, people need to become a little more self-aware of their uh, habits, like whether it's social media, whether it's posting what they're doing or what they're, you know, influencing on or whatever that is. And do that sort of reflection like we were talking about, where it's like find the little things that make you happy and do more of that and yeah. do less of the mindless scrolling that um, also the impact that has on you to see how everybody else is posting the highlights of their life while you're sitting there on your couch scrolling social media isn't really good for your your burnout, depression, or any other mental health anxiety Mm -hmm. you have. Yeah, absolutely. I like hearing from people who like take time off of media and then come back and they're like, oh, I noticed within the first day, I was like, oh, maybe my Mm -hmm. vacation, like I should have posted pictures of from my vacation or my vacation wasn't good enough or like, oh, look at this person doing this thing. Maybe I need to do that thing. Maybe I need to buy this thing. It's just like, we don't do well with that constant influx. So way to control it. You're right. Well, I'm not perfect at it. And that's, um, you know, it's just been, it's been time and it's been hitting, you know, rock bottom and being, you know, people are mean on the internet and like, (laughs) usually it doesn't impact me or if it does, it's very minuscule, but you know, there's times when you're stressed or you're, you're depressed or you're sad about something, or you just don't need that extra little like nudge Mm -hmm. of of negativity in your life. And it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. But Definitely. do you feel do you feel pressure now? You've got your book. Your book just came out the thirteenth mm-hmm. of February, I think it yeah. was. Yeah, your book just came out February thirteenth. It's the beginning of March as we're filming this right now. Um, do you feel like added pressure on yourself to be on social media, promoting your book, being consistent with the type of content you produce, especially on mm-hmm. TikTok where you're most active? Or I would say I shouldn't say that. I would say you, I, you seem yeah. to be most active. Okay. Um, You're right. Is there, yeah, yeah. Is there like an added pressure that you find yourself feeling now that you've got the book, you've got the consistency that you've built for your content? Um, how do you manage that if you feel that at all? I do, but I would say I'm so glad that I had a business that I was already using social media marketing for ahead of time because I understand how to make a content calendar and that it does have to be kind of impersonal. And yes, the posts feel a little bit colder, like they're warmer, the the closer, like when it's, you make it live and you post it right away and people are following along with you in your day, it is a lot warmer content. And I do love following influencers who do that. But after doing it, I, I can, I could not maintain that schedule. I, I was living my life through my phone yeah. camera lens and I hated it. I don't know how vloggers do it. Um, and so just like had already experimented with what media would work. And so I feel like now I definitely do feel that sense of like, I could always be doing more, but I am content with sticking to a content calendar and feeling like that's enough. Like that had to be my definition of enough. Um, and then I can always like tap my Penguin Random House team and see if they would like to see anything different or more from me. But if, if you know, they're saying I'm already doing what most authors are doing, probably more because I'm already used to being online. Some authors are great authors, but they are authors 100%. And I kind of jumped into being an author from another area where I, I was already doing this dance. So um, it. it I've found which I think is going to become more common too, by the way, like I think you're doing it the way it's, it's more likely to happen now with the way social media has helped people, Mm -hmm. um, you know, gain some followings and get that opportunity. Definitely. And I always like, always loved writing. Like I, on every little list that I made of like things that like bucket list, like things I want to do in my life, uh, writing a book was always on it. I wouldn't have known that it would be about burnout, but I'm just like always writing and so I feel like I've been practicing for years um, and really loved that piece of it. So it felt very natural, but writing a book is also um, a lot, I, a, a lot of work and I, I'm not sure 
I could see how celebrities who do it, like do it once, probably have a lot of help writing the book and then they're like never mind (laughs) this was enough ones was enough because it's you it's such an intentional process and if you don't like love writing and love editing and you know really care about it then i could see how it's just kind of like a side project and Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily get the like love and attention it could i completely agree as someone who's started writing a book I'm like, this is overwhelming. I can't even like, I can't even even get my thoughts out quick enough. And then they're unstructured. So no, that that makes perfect sense. And it's funny, because I am a writer, like I write content for work, I just haven't written a book about myself, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that you're in. And also, I think, when you get your book, right? Which I want to say, congratulations. That's Thank something you. you've wanted to do your whole life. That's amazing, right? Yeah. I, I mean, Thanks. you should applaud yourself for that and everyone should Thank applaud you. you for it. Thank so, and it's good. Again, the cure for burnout. <laughs> um, the link will be in the show notes. Uh, it's good so far. I, I think I told you earlier, I'm halfway, not halfway, maybe a little less than halfway through page 81. Um, the, uh, the last thing I want to ask you about here before I, I turn it over to you is when you were writing this book, And you got yourself, again, just recently published. What were the overarching takeaways that you would want people to know about your book and your expertise and your experiences uh, so that if they want to go buy the book, they have a a little bit of a preview in your own words instead of mine of what they can expect when they... you know, take a look at the, this book. And it's, it's also, by the way, it's kind of like a guidebook. It's more than, um, you know, just reading a textbook or something on burnout. There's like exercises and, um, you know, different uh, documentation you can do to sort of really figure out where you're at. So I'll ask you to share or like overall on your book. Yeah, I'm glad it gave off that impression. Yes, we I wanted it to be so this book, I think that it's clear going through it that it was born from one on one coaching, like actual coaching and working with companies that it's, it, there's a lot of like checklists of like, you might be this if you check off these boxes, there's graphics going through it, there's a lot of um, kind of, okay, you've learned the information, this is the application portion where you I want you to turn around and actually do it. And you're also kind of coached through it or at least coached around yourself because I I know the points where people experience resistance. I've already seen it and lived it. And so um, then to coach you, you around that resistance so you can actually apply the changes. And I like, well, I always say like, there's so many good books on the market that are about either burnout or stress management or all of that stuff. And usually there's a lot of good information, but I really wanted people to get the transformation with this book and yes. actually have those actionable steps that are that can be done in a manageable way because I have also been burned out and I'm not just trying to tell you that you're burned out and then give you more things to do like it's (laughs) supposed to be kind of a relief (laughs) yeah that's a really good point because it's funny when I I bought um a guided journal on like your um down here like you're doing shadow work it's for doing Mm. shadow work right and um I got it and it was so much freaking work. I'm like, I just don't want to like do this anymore. So I'm like, I'm probably like one fifth of the way through it and I'm taking a break from it. But yeah, it can become cumbersome if it's like a lot of heavy lifting. Um, So I I don't get that impression uh, so far here either at all. It is very practical. And um, even like it's relatable, right? Like the TV show thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to reflect on myself or, you know, the pockets of rest, all of that stuff are just really... um, uh, r- really simple, practical, easy to understand that you, you don't have to be some kind of expert or doctor or uh, burnout yeah. uh, specialist to do so. Mm-hmm. I appreciate the the uh, simpleness of it. Thank you. Yeah. And I feel like somebody told me that it's got a, the tone of somebody who's online. And so I was tr- like, and then we kind of talked about it. And I think when you're on, especially like Instagram or TikTok, you've got people's attention for exactly five seconds before they scroll past whatever it is. So you kind of have to be quick with what you're delivering and deliver it in a modern way. I love reading. And so like, I'll read these professional development books and I, my eyes are glazing over like a couple paragraphs Mm -hmm. in because they're, it's so, it's so good, but it's not uh, what I call consumable. And like, that's basically the most important criteria for any book I read is, is it easy to read and really consumable? Because after a long day of work, I'm not going to sit here and read something challenging. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I know consumability is important. That's a, that's actually a really good point. I feel like, um, 
more books are doing that. I, not up there. I had another author on, uh, a friend of mine, Steph Sarazin. She wrote a, a book and it was like very much, it was similar in this style where it was like so relatable because it was kind of like, here's some context, here's some things to think about, here's how I felt about it at this time. And then here's how you can kind of uh, reflect on yourself. Yeah. And it was a book about grief. So it mm -hmm. was very, it was just like really relatable. And I think that's the piece to your point. The social media part is very smart, very spot on. Um, you've got to grab attention, but you've got to like bring people along with you. It's not, it's not like it used to be. What's your, what yeah. do you have any? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I'm just agreeing. Yeah. You've got to yeah. deliver it, deliver it quick and kind of like, uh, trick people almost into reading something, um, and by delivering it a certain way and then including what they really need to know, but that they might not have gotten to without the initial piece. Really good point. It's like you should, your next book should maybe be like book writing for the TikTok generation <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I know. Oh, literacy rates are going down, man. It's going to be, we're going to see <laughs> what happens. I know. Uh, I know. I should actually get someone. To, that was really <laughs> bad. It got really bad during COVID too. Really literacy bad. rates are so bad. You know, what's funny is you said the attention span thing, like reading helps you keep your attention span. That's the reason that like, I don't read more is because I can't, it can't keep my attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know what fits. It might just be the types of books that I'm reading. Like I am just flipping through them because I'm so excited to read them, but I had to do so much reading of uh, just like n n books that weren't necessarily my types of books in order to figure out what my types of books were. So persevere, don't be afraid to DNF, do not finish. Like don't be afraid to just, I didn't like this, so I'm not going to read the rest of it. And that's why I love having a Kindle with Kindle Unlimited. It sounds like I'm plugging it. I, I'm not sponsored by them. Um, that's Please just use how code I read Emily my books. at Kindle.com. <laughs> yeah, com. Oh, I wish. <laughs> they should sponsor me, honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like then I don't feel bad because it's just like a library, basically, where I try a book, I hate it, I return it. And it's like, not, I'm not. Yeah. I don't feel like I already spent $30 on this book and I, so I have to finish it. Then that's how you learn to hate reading. So I like the quick cycle of, do I like this? No. Do I like this? No. Do I like this? No. That's smart. Do, so you, you casually mentioned, um, you don't really share what books you're reading anymore, but what's your favorite? I got two questions and then, then we'll turn it over to you. What's your favorite fiction book that you've read? And then if you've read any good, helpful self-help books, I would love to hear oh, yeah. those too. So many. Oh, uh, favorite fiction book? Oh my gosh. Mm, I would say my common example uh, of just like fun fiction, and this isn't really, this is kind of romanticy, but not really. Um, I love the Throne of Glass series. I know Sarah J. Mass is having her moment right now. She as well deserved. Um, and then I'm looking at my bookshelves. I don't know. <laughs> I've read so many books. I feel like that's like my easy default, but I usually spin a lot deeper into different. Um, I don't know. Oh, you've got one that goes on both sides. Oh yeah, this or whole is wall just is just oh, wow. all books. Um, okay, I'm gonna stick to that because, uh, okay. and then I I won't necessarily give a dark romance example. Um, and then fiction. I li I've I've been listening to a lot of or nonfiction on Audible. What did I just listen to that I liked? Where's my phone? <laughs> Sorry, I might have to crop this. No, that's okay. No, that's um, totally fine. I just listened to Influence is Your Superpower by Zoe Chance, and that was really good. I liked that a lot. Oh, it was. I actually saw that at um, Target, I think it was. Yeah. I, I was looking good. at that. It's on uh, like uh, charisma and how everybody can be charismatic and then use that in different ways and then and like negotiation and stuff. Um, Die with Zero by Bill Perkins, really good about... Uh, living your life and spending your money while you actually can enjoy it because a lot of people like you know live until they're about 80 and then the people they pass their money down to are about 60 and when they really needed that money was actually when they were you know in their 30s or in their 20s so they could do stuff <laughs> yeah so they could actually yeah. do it with it so it's a, it's about all of that and that's really interesting, that's really interesting. um but oh, I would say probably, but that I liked the most. Oh shoot! Well, I like so many books. I like the Paradox <laughs> of Choice by Barry Schwartz um, about how we don't actually like having as many choices as we do, and it paralyzes us and always makes us question ourselves. Yeah. That was really good. And the Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin, of course. I'm just always like listening to books or reading books, and I I like all of yeah. it. There's so yeah, much good yeah. information out there. 
There is, there is. But to your point, it can become information overload. And I get yeah. myself there too, where I'm like, like now my, my big thing is like, what the hell am I supposed to eat? Because four mm -hmm. years ago, I thought I was supposed to eat beyond meat and stop <laughs> eating. Meat. And now everyone's like, no, that's just, uh, <laughs> that's, that's actually not healthy for you, obviously. And I look back, I'm like, it's still a process. Why did I ever think that was a good idea? But like, you just get so much information. So I don't even know what I'm supposed to eat anymore. Oh, as um. a vegetarian, <laughs> I feel that. I also am a Beyond Meat consumer. And I, I mean, I've been vegetarian for like more than 20 something years. But oh, wow. so okay. I was back eating the Sandy Boca burgers back when they first came out. Like, oh man, there was no options then. But now all the alternative options, you're not really supposed to be eating anyways. So I know. and they taste so good. I know. Like Beyond Meat, those sausages so that they have, Beyond Sausage. Mm -hmm. I used to like that you couldn't get them in Chicago in like 2019 or 2018. They were always sold out. I would like mm -hmm. camp outside of Whole yeah. Foods to get those because <laughs> I went vegan for a year yeah. um, with the with an occasional pizza cheat. But it was like I lived on Beyond Meat mm -hmm. for a protein and because it tasted like meat. And I just yeah. wanted meat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, it's crazy. Just, yeah. I don't know what we're supposed to be doing anymore. I know. Tofu, I info. guess. You're not even supposed to have that much soy, though. So I know. I don't know. Eggs? But I get the egg egg a lot. And it like one egg undercooked. I'm not eating eggs for a year. So that's not the answer either. <laughs> that's, I've had that, ha <laughs> had that happen. Not even cooking it, but cracking it. And then I'm like, well, I'm not eating eggs mm -hmm. anymore. Or, mm -hmm. yeah, or one too many. Like I have a list of things I don't eat. Like just one too many documentaries on some stuff too. And yeah. it's just like, Oh my God. But oh, anyway, man. um, want to so, know what else is on that list? What should I be right. eating? Oh, I mean, I'd be happy to walk you through all <laughs> the things I don't eat and why, but you'll, <laughs> most of it you don't eat if you're vegetarian, but yeah. yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal out there. So I'll turn it over to you and give you a chance to ask me anything, uh, that would be of interest to you. Yeah. Well, um, I always like to hear about if you have any, uh, this is kind of a hard question to ask, but like personal lows, like your moment where you realize I'm really burned out, uh, and uh, no. something's got to change. Yeah, <laughs> it's I like now I might be hitting that now. Mm -hmm. Um, no, that's a really, really good question. I, I've never been asked that, uh, before. Um, so I do think I joke now, but like now I'm, I'm kind of, um, and I even catch myself as I'm like, I'm talking to you, I find myself like starting a sentence and I'm like, where am I actually going with this? Cause I'm more thinking out loud, which is, I know a sign for me when I start kind of like word vomiting, that's because like my brain, I, I called it earlier. It's, it's melted vanilla ice cream right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. um, so right now, but I, I have recently, um, I, I recently took over producing my podcast on my own, mm -hmm. um, at least for now. And so I'm finding myself like, you know, holding down a pretty demanding full-time job. I'm, um, you know, managing a, or helping with manage a nonprofit organization that is very cumbersome mentally and emotionally to do. And then, um, you know, the podcast, and then I'm also, uh, taking like courses and stuff to, to, um, you know, better my, understanding of some things and like leadership courses and stuff like that. So I'm just sitting here and I'm like, man, oh, and I thought it would be a great idea this year to start another podcast that's exclusively on YouTube. So, hey, what what <laughs> better time to do that as I'm, you know, taking over my own regular podcast production to go ahead yeah. and start a new one while yeah. all this other stuff's going on. So like, I'm kind of feeling lately like that. And I know in a few hours, I'm going to meet with my therapist and I did not do my homework, which I was supposed to do, which was kind of assess, you know, the importance of these things. And, mm -hmm. you know, do they make me happy? And it makes me think, too, about your comment earlier. And, you know, sh she asked me to think about this and this I can say, but like, or I can confidently say the podcast, as much work as it is, it helps. Mm -hmm. And so like having these conversations with you or whoever the guest is, like they help me um, with, you know, human connection and human, human to human conversation, but also the editing sucks and, <laughs> you know, hosting it everywhere sucks. Like yeah. it takes freaking forever. Making the graphics sucks. Mm -hmm. It all takes forever. Yeah. And finding the clips sucks. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I clip up a couple for YouTube. That also sucks. <laughs> yeah. So it's a lot of work. But at the end of the day, it's like having these conversations lights up my, my brain. And then also, you know, being able to share it with other people. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, like I like to 
have conversations with people that I think are interesting, have fun experience or have expertise mm -hmm. and cover the nuance so that when I'm getting to know someone or their expertise like you for the first time, I want my listeners to feel the same way. Like they're in this conversation with me. And I get that often from people too, where it's like, oh, you asked the question I wanted to know next. And so, you know, having that relationship and stuff and know that I'm contributing to help people does make this important. It does make it something that's beneficial um, for me to do for my burnout. But it is like, it's that managing that time. And I just recently went, I think probably about a month where I didn't see anyone or go anywhere or do anything with anyone because I was just like, melting into the couch at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And then the other thing mm -hmm. that I notice I do um, lately from burnout is I will stay up so late because I just don't want to go to sleep and have to do the day again. Yeah. And that is such a bad mindset and I'm very well aware of it. But like, that's kind of like where I've been feeling here we are in March. The last couple of months, I've been very like aware of it coming up and creeping up. And now I'm just trying to figure out, okay, well, I have a new normal again. How do I manage all of this stuff and still have time to protect my peace? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, I feel like I'm now I'm like trauma dumping almost. But <laughs> the other thing, like another thing I've noticed I do is, and it's, it's helpful, but it's not like, so I, I do a lot of writing for work. I'll like voice to text my blogs mm -hmm. while I'm taking my walks at mm -hmm. night or in the morning, which are supposed to be my like tech free time. Yeah. But I'm like, oh, I can really get ahead of this if I just start voice to texting while I'm mm -hmm. so even then, like I recognize, oh, like that's kind of not helping, right? Because now I'm taking something that brings me peace mm -hmm. and recharges me and I'm turning into turning it into something that is not recharging. Yeah. Yeah. That's just like objectively a lot of stuff to include in a day in <laughs> life, but especially in a day. Yeah. yeah, it is. But you know, that's one of the reasons I'm, you know, I, I got your book. And once I started reading it and reached out to you and, and, um, you know, it, it is, it's about like, okay, how do I, you know, find my balance again, in my mm -hmm. new normal, you know, shed the things that don't serve me right now, and, yeah. and keep moving forward. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've, I've found other things too, like I started boxing. Um, and I just, uh, I bought like a certain number of classes at the beginning of the year went through those. And then I just bought like an unlimited pass for the next year because I, I let the anger out, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's, I feel very good afterwards. I do feel mm -hmm. recharged. So yeah. it is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in it now, which is part of the reason I wanted to have you on and mm -hmm. part of the reason I picked up your book, but I am trying to find those ways to sort of protect my peace and, and learn how to not be burnt out in my new normal. Yeah. And I think it's great that you said like right now, like what I need to take care of or like change like for right now because it, it, you can like you know circle back to being on a lot of those things and doing a lot of those things maybe just next season and it I feel like there's a lot of pressure for people to like live all of their life and anything they could think to include right in this present moment and then but it, even if it doesn't fit but they're they're mm. sometimes it's gotta wait or sometimes things need to be paused for x amount of time and I will be the first person to say when everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. Mm -hmm. So I need to practice that too. But yeah. that's very good. Very good point. Very good feedback for people to consider, myself included. I feel like it's like the 80-20 rule where it's like usually 20% of what we do gets us 80% of the results. And so in our personal life, like 80-20 or like tw the 20% that I do outside of work is, I, uh, you know, my reading and uh, like call it, I'll just like quality time making dinner um and talking to somebody that i care about and that's that's it and if that and that while that doesn't you know put make me a star student make me like the highest achiever i had to get to that that point of it's okay to do less and less uh, a happy life looks like doing this amount and then maintaining it maintaining it's the hardest part because it's so yeah. easy to give up to pick up another hobby but uh, maybe in the next season you're exactly right. And, and I, I keep picking up new hobbies myself. So it's, you just get balance. It's balance, balance, balance. Next it season. Is. We'll, we'll fix it next season. Mm -hmm. That'll be the new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let me know when yeah. you decide what is your top priorities and what you are pausing for at the time being to, I would love, to get some uh, peace. 
I would love to catch some sort of illness that would give me peace from work. And <laughs> I'm just mm-hmm. kidding. <laughs> kind of. Well, you're kidding. reading the right book. <laughs> right. <now. laughs> right. Right. Well, where can people find you? And of course, all those links will be below, but on your socials and your book. Um, I am on Instagram and TikTok and my handle is Emily B. Ruth. So E-M-I-L-Y-B-R-U-T-H. And um, my website is emilyballesteros.com. Um, and that's linked on all my social handles. I feel like the social handles are the easiest way to kind of get to me. And then uh, my book is called The Cure for Burnout and it's sold most places. So you can just look it up and then it's there. And if you're a busy person who knows themselves and will not sit down to read a book, uh, read the audio book or listen to the audio book um, and just put it on like 1.5 speed and put it on in the background while you do stuff. That's cool. Did you did you uh, read your own book? I did. Yes. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it Very was really cool. cool. It's a whole different skill set. It was, I stand by that. It was harder than writing the actual book, doing the audio book. Oh, really? <laughs> what was it? So if you don't different. mind me asking. Yeah. What yeah. was it like? Um, so I compared to like, have you ever wakeboarded or water skied? Like when you don't normally do it and you're the next day, your forearms are so incredibly sore mm. that you like, can't even make a fist because you're just not used to using those fine muscles. It's Boxing. like that, <laughs> but yeah, it's so like anything you pick up that's new where you're like, I have never been sore in this way before that's how it was but vocally and so you're you're like sitting in this soundproof booth with your headphones and you're just kind of got an ipad and you're sitting there and you're reading a whole book out loud in a week so it's you know how many hours at a time um they would try to have you take a break every like hour to two hours but you're there for like eight hour days ish yeah or if not a little bit more just are you getting like coached like voice yeah. of God coming in and saying, Emily, you're not saying this with enough emphasis on this word or whatever. Yes. yes. So wow. in the booth, you have your headset in your headset is your producer um, who is reading along the text with you and will correct you if it's like, oh, you said that's instead of that, take it again. Like, oh, you like, you know, th- we've got to change how we say this because it says um, you're going to see a graphic, but it's like the audiobook, so they're not going to see a graphic. So you like kind of work around things. And um, then you've got wow. a sound engineer who's also there who's saying like, you made a mouth noise, drink some water and take that line again. Or like, we're hearing stomach sounds. So give it a second and then take that paragraph again. And so it, it's really intentionally done. And it's really cool. You probably read the book in total, like uh, 1.5 times through just because you're going back and redoing so many things to make right. sure the quality is there. So it was really just like, it, it was, it's not that it was uh hard, like when you think about what you're doing, like, it's not like I'm out there, you know, doing physical labor or anything, but it was just so focused and it was using the same muscles repeatedly. So it was just really interesting. And I have so much respect for the people who are out there reading 800 page books because Woo. They got to be tired of really strong yeah. vocal cords. <laughs> I can't even imagine that. That's way, way different than I would have anticipated that being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a really cool process to see. Um, but now, because like I said, I'll read like dark romance books and there's like spicy scenes in them. And now I feel so bad for the people who have to read these in a booth with like people listening. Like <laughs> that really character. takes you out of the moment. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. I never thought of that either. <laughs> well, this was this was so much fun. And I appreciate you taking the time to come on and teach us about burnout and talk about your book. And hopefully we can help some people, um, you know, uncover the cure. And mm-hmm. I Absolutely. appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Anybody who spent time with us. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.